If you have your personal copy of God's Word, please turn with me, if you will, to the book of Matthew. And we're going to take a look at chapter 9. The book is Matthew, and the chapter is 9. Beginning with verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to, si or to say, Rise and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowds saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed, but new wine is put into fresh wine skins, and so both are preserved. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him, and touched the fringe of his garment, for she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away. For the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. 
And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. And as they were going away, behold, a demon-possessed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Just read for you Matthew chapter 9, and it is from that passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, the power of Jesus. The power of Jesus. Throughout the Bible, we can hear God speaking to the deepest needs of those who look to him for guidance and help. Only as we listen to his word can we become equipped to do his work. Matthew 9 contains material that could command our attention for years. It gives us a picture of the movement and ministry of our Lord as he met the needs of those that were around him. And as we study Matthew chapter 9, we can see that he was very busy serving others. His heart was compassionate, and he gave himself completely to serving the various needs of others. For everybody does not have the same problems. Matthew reveals in this chapter that our Lord was involved almost constantly in controversy with those who disagreed with his work and with his method of doing things. The Pharisees that were representing the religious establishment of that day were his most severe critics. It is interesting to note that our Lord did not let this controversy and disagreement calls him to swerve from his purpose. Neither did he let their vicious attacks embitter him and cause him to retaliate. We see our Lord giving himself unreservedly to his task and refusing to yield before the opposition of his antagonists. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. If Jesus was concerned during his earthly life by the suffering of those around him, we can be certain that even today he is moved with compassion as our eternal Lord. He will minister. He will serve us with sympathy and power. There are three brief points that I would like to bring to your attention on this afternoon, and the lesson will be yours to respond to. The first point that I see in Matthew chapter 9 is that this chapter deals with the lordship of Jesus. Let's start with the lordship of Jesus. In Matthew 9, we have an outstanding display of the power 
and authority of Jesus. When we look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, we see Jesus as the Lord over disease when he healed a paralytic. In Matthew chapter 9 and verses 9, we see Jesus as the Lord over life when he called Matthew to follow him. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 26, we see Jesus as the Lord over death when he raised a ruler's daughter from the dead. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through 31, we see Jesus as the Lord over blindness when he opened the eyes of blind men. And in Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 through 34, we see Jesus as the Lord over demonic influences when he cast out a demon from a dumb man and the man began to speak. Jesus is Lord over the greatest foes that we face. And I want us to know on this afternoon that Jesus, the one that we serve, he wants to give us victory over the enemies that would defeat and or even destroy us. Jesus is worthy to be the Lord over our lives and of all that we are and have. This is why he is Lord. And if we are not convinced that he is Lord, then there's something wrong with us when we see all that Jesus was able to do and the authority that he had over everything that even we can face in the 21st century. But the second point that I want to bring to your attention from this chapter is the importance of faith. <clears throat> the importance of faith in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9 speaks dramatically of the importance of faith as the human response that opens the door for God's power to do its work. Because we need to recognize on this afternoon that faith is man's response to God, but grace is God's response to man. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, we see the faith of the paralytic and his friends opened the door of grace and brought forth both forgiveness and the restoration of health. In Matthew chapter 9, in the verses 18, the faith of the grief-stricken ruler opened the door of grace and made possible our Lord reviving his daughter back to life. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22, the faith of the woman who suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 long years opened the door of grace and brought healing to her body. And in Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 and 28, the faith of two blind men who were seeking their sight opened the door of grace, and they were rewarded by Christ with sight. My brothers and sisters, on this afternoon, the refusal to have faith in Jesus actually places limitations upon his power to change lives and circumstances that would defeat us. Now, this has nothing to do with Jesus being impotent, but it has everything to do with us being sinful. This has nothing to do with us being more powerful than God, but it has everything to do with us not believing that he is able and thus we don't turn to him in our time of need. The Jesus we read about in the book of Matthew is the same Jesus who is Lord today. And we need to trust him as we face the painful problems of life so that he might work changes in us and through us by his grace. And so Matthew chapter 9 teaches us about the lordship of Christ. It teaches us about the importance of faith. And I want to close on this afternoon by talking about the purpose of prayer. 
the purpose of prayer. Matthew 9 provides us with many examples that disclose the nature and purpose of prayer. In this chapter, we discover dialogues between needy believers and an all-sufficient Lord. The relationship we see that Jesus had with individuals on earth is the same relationship we must have with God the Father today. God talks to us through his word, but we talk to God through prayer. These individuals had a need and they went to Jesus with their petition. And as a result, Jesus gave them an answer and solved their problem. And so, my brothers and sisters, on, afternoon, on this afternoon, if we have a need, then we need to take our needs to God Almighty. If we need an answer, then we must open our Bibles and listen to the Most High God. If we seek his will and do his will, then whatever the problem is, it will be Solved. We see in the text that some people brought a paralytic to Jesus and the paralytic was able to rise, pick up his bed and go home. Problem solved. We see that a ruler sought Jesus regarding the status of his daughter and Jesus was able to raise the girl back to life. Another problem solved. A woman with an issue of blood for 12 years, she approached Jesus and Jesus made her whole again. Again, we see a problem solved. And we see that blind men cried out to Jesus and Jesus gave them sight. Once again in this chapter, we see a problem solved. This chapter closes with a word from the Lord to the effect that we are to enter into dialogue with the Father concerning where we are to labor, and that is we are to labor in the fields, we are to labor throughout the world that are white unto harvest. The world is ready to receive Jesus. The question is, will we volunteer to be his messengers and his servants to make an impact in this worn, torn world. So may we pray for opportunity and may we pray for boldness so that we may report for duty and listen to the divine instructions of Jesus because people are lost and they need to be saved. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So where do you stand on this afternoon? If this lesson has done nothing else, it should have informed us of the fact that no matter what we are going through, Jesus is able. Jesus has the power. He is Lord over anything that we go through. So even though we may have problems that perceive to be big, instead of going to God and telling him how big our problems is, maybe we need to go to our problems and tell our problems how big our God is because he is Lord over all. And we need to have faith. Look at the difference that faith made in the lives of the people in Matthew chapter 9. When they responded to God in faith, God responded to them with his grace and his mercy. And the one thing that we need more than anything is his grace, is his mercy, is his love, 
is his forgiveness. So let us operate, let us activate those characteristics of the divine by having faith in Jesus. Because we are saved by faith. We are to walk by faith. We are to live by faith. We are to respond in faith. And when we do those things, look at what Jesus can and will do for us. And then we have to pray. All of these individuals had problems, but none of their problems were solved until such a time that they cried out and approached and sought and brought their issues to the divine. See, whenever we refuse to cry out, whenever we refuse to approach, whenever we refuse to seek, Whenever we refuse to bring, these are all elements and characteristics of pride. And whenever we have pride, we try to do things on our own. But when we remove such pride and we humble ourselves and we cry out, regardless of what others may say, if we just simply bring our burdens to God, regardless of what others may say, if we seek the Lord, regardless of what others may say, if we approach his throne of grace, regardless of what others may say, we can see that he will provide an answer and his answer will be solved according to his power. And so may we pray, pray to God, bring our situations to him, seek him in prayer, approach him in prayer, cry out to God in prayer. Let us do so with faith and let us bend the knee to the one, Jesus Christ, who paid the cost on Calvary to be our boss and to do things like this for us. So maybe you're having some evil thoughts. Jesus knows how to cast out that demon. Maybe you are unable to see the glorious light of the gospel. Jesus can heal you of your spiritual blindness. Maybe you have been dealing with a situation for so long that people don't want to bother you because you are defined by your problem. We don't even know this lady's name, but we know what her issue was. And isn't that a shame that we live in a world even today that we have brothers and sisters in Christ that we don't know their name, but we know they had a child out of wedlock. We don't know her name, but we know that she's been married three times. We don't know his name, but we know that he can't keep a job. When we define people by their problems, we become the problem when God has called for us to be the solution. So will we be the solution knowing that there are people even like this today in which they struggle to walk with God. They have issues. Some are spiritually dead, and yet Jesus is the cure-all to everything anybody will go through. I want you to know on this morning that we serve an amazing God, an awesome God. And I, saw, I know I said this morning, this afternoon, we serve, a, we serve not only a good God in the morning, we serve a good God in the afternoon. And I know this is an afternoon service. God is good. Will we trust him? Will we turn to him? Will we believe in him? We know Jesus has power. And if Jesus has power, then like the song we're about to sing, there is power in his blood. The power in his blood brings about a new covenant. The power in his blood is able to forgive us of our sins. The power in his blood is able to make us brand new. The power in his blood is able to wash away our sins. And we meet the blood of Jesus when we enter the waters of baptism by faith. Will you respond to the gospel call on this afternoon? Make a wise hearted decision while together we stand and sing the song.